Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about what is going on in Germany, part two. What are the reasons and implications of its move to the right? Our co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Our guests for the show are Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar, and Manfred Henningsen, emeritus professor from UH Manoa in political science. Welcome to the show to you all. Last week, we talked about AFD and how it was growing as a right-wing and maybe extremist movement in Germany and how it represented a right-wing movement all over Europe. So Manfred, you just came back from Germany after hmm, a few weeks there. We need to know from you, what did you learn about modern Germany? What did you learn about AFD? Did its existence and influence surprise you when you were there? What was in the newspapers and the TV? Uh, what are people saying about it? Tell us about your trip, Manfred. I am not completely comfortable with the general argument that you made that Germany is moving to the right. What is more interesting in Germany today is the split between the two Germanys, the eastern part and the western part. Now, the western part has a majority of the population, 62 to 70 million, whereas the population in the eastern part has been shrinking and is now at a level of 1905. But what you have is the resentment in the east, in the eastern parts. And this resentment about the takeover of former, the former GDR by <clears throat> West Germany with huge capital infusion uh, is one of the reasons. But you have to remember also from 49 until today, 7 million people left the East. So what you have there is a depopulation. And especially young women have left and have le left behind uh, testosterone-prone uh, young men who are angry uh, about these women having left. So what you have is uh, a polit politics of resentment that has emerged in the East, and that has uh, supported the AFD as well as the new left radical party founded by Wagenknecht, a young, well, not young, she's in her 50s, a former communist a uh, politician, uh, she's a member of uh, the Bundestag, uh, and they met, they moved immediately from uh, zero to 16%. Now, what you have to somehow also realize is that Germany now is the country with the largest immigration population in Europe. It sometimes resembles <clears throat> the status of the United States in the 19th century. Uh, you know, 17% of Germans living today have an immigrant background. You have uh, more Muslims living in Germany than in France, uh, up to 7 million. And you have an unbelievable asylum uh, population, you know, 1 million per year. So what you have are all kinds of problems that have nothing to do uh, with the Nazi past that uh, is so uh, is always mentioned in in the United States you know the shadow of hitler does not play the role in all of these phenomena that i just mentioned now there are similarities between this uh, change of the german population to places like Scandinavia, you know, you have maybe read that Sweden is now trying to buy the return of immigrants or migrants, you know, give them 30, uh, the equivalence of $34,000 to return where they came from. Now, they don't want to return to Syria or Afghanistan, you know, because those are uh, territories uh, that mean death to them. Uh, this solution, the Scandinavian solution, you have the similar problem in, Den in Denmark, does not apply at this point, at least, uh, to Germany. Now, you could say what adds to the mess that people think Germany is in is uh, a coalition government led by Scholz, a social democrat, with the Greens and the neoliberals, that has not delivered. 
And next Sunday, on the 22nd, you will have another election in Germany in one eastern state in Brandenburg. And uh, it will be, I think, a question for the survival of Scholz, whether the social democrats that are in power in Brandenburg will win. If they don't win, if the radical left and the radical right, you know, will gain more uh, votes than uh, than the social democrats, I think that may be the end of the future of Scholz. And now whether the SPD will replace him with the most prominent, the most uh, uh, attractive social democratic politician in contemporary Germany, I mean, the defense minister Pistorius, I don't know. Uh, that's still an open question. And the elections are next September. So uh, they still have a year to, to, to clear that. At this point, it looks as if the Christian Democrats will win the next election and uh, the next chancellor will be from Angela Merkel's party. Let me ask you, before we open the floor for questions, let me ask you how you feel about this. In a way, I find uh, Germany is at this point a country that has undergone radical changes with less disruption than you have in other European countries. Uh, so there is not a big uh, revolt in the making. Uh, the AfD will not become a majority party in uh, in the West. Uh, and what happens to the radical left, I don't know. Uh, they may be more sympathetic. I mean, the radical right and the radical left are against the support, the German support of the Ukraine of Ukraine. They are afraid of Putin. And uh, both of them, the radical left and the radical right. Uh, now, whether uh, that will lead to a lowering of German support for uh, the Ukraine, I don't think so, because if the Christian Democrats come to power in the next year in the in the parliamentary election, they will continue to support. And so far, the Social Democrats will not stop supporting. Uh, the Ukraine will not stop su supporting the uh, Ukraine either. Tim, you have questions you want to pose to Manfred? Manfred, uh, you know, the Berlin Wall, I think, fell in November 89, so that's 35 years ago. Right. If I recall those days, the Deutschmark was strong. Uh, Germany economically right. was ex extremely very, uh, very strong economically. And now there was the task of bringing on um, an infrastructure differential between East and West Germany. Uh, there certainly was high unemployment in East Germany, and a lot of that was absorbed into the West Germany economy. If I recall the news, the news headlines back in the day is that after a year or two, that was creating some resentment um, that taxes were going up to pay for infrastructure improvements, and uh, unemployment was starting to work its way into West Germany. Um, to what degree do you think some of that resentment, if there was resentment, if, uh, has lingered and it's lingered into or, or transformed into some resentment about immigration? Not in, not in West Germany. In East Germany, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when you're driving through Germany today, you could sometimes say that East German cities look better uh, because of these tremendous investment in the infrastructure uh, of these rundown cities. I mean, I was in the GDR a few times before the wall came down and watching that, I mean, some of them look better than the West German cities. So it is, but you see, it is more an emotional resentment that lingers in the East, among the older generation, you know, that were part of the uh, communist establishment. And then, as I said, uh, also, it has to do with uh, these young men, you know, who find themselves without women. If, and then you have, the, you know, this bio-nationalist resentment, you know, of uh, marrying you know, or falling in love with uh, migrant women. I mean, the level of migration presence in the East is very, very low. 
for reasons that have to do with uh, demonstrations against them. Uh, in West Germany, as I said, it's very high. Uh, and, you know, you have through the, through the war against the Ukraine, you have, as I said, two million Ukrainians living in, West, in, in the Western part of Germany. Uh, now that causes some resentment because, you know, they are not simply living there, they are getting financial support from the German government. Uh, and, but they are not allowed to work. I mean, this is the same madness as in the United States, you know, that people have to wait for many, many months to get the permit uh, to work. Uh, and uh, for, you know, ordinary Germans, you could say, it is not understandable uh, why the state should finance these uh, these uh, uh, refugees and don't let them work. Uh, now, on the other hand, you can also look. I saw that on a farm by a nephew, you know, who had a Syrian family, four people, and a Ukrainian family living there. Now, the state does not only pay the Ukrainian and the Syrians, uh, my nephew suddenly gets money too from the state for, uh, you know, pe uh, keeping up, having these families, uh, the four Syrians and the four Ukrainians living on the farm. So there is, uh, in that sense, you could say, not a protest emerging from those people because to some extent they, they, they're profiting from the, the migrants. Let's move on to another question from Jean. Jean, do you, you want to follow up or do you want to ask about things we talked about last week? No, we kind of covered our own. Uh, it was kind of an introduction to this, I think. We, we really zeroed in on the AFD because the elections had just been held. And uh, regarding that, subsequent to the elections, and uh, the AFD came in first, I think, in the Thuringia, is it? In Thuringia, yes. Yes. And Hecke was the, is the leader of the AFD there. And Schultz, uh, the uh, leader of Germany, uh, met with Hecke right afterward. And uh, I think Hecke got more than 30% of the vote and came in second in Saxony in East Germany. That's not a huge piece of the population, but it was quite an increase over a short period of time. This is a young party. And uh, Schultz wanted to meet with him. And uh, after he met with him, he made some changes in the immigration policy, which conveyed to me that Schultz is, and perhaps the major parties are looking at this young party that is growing, and it doesn't need to be a majority, it can be a plurality, and thinking, rethinking some of their policies. Number one, cracking down on immigration, and number two, possibly, do you think that this young party that's doing so well could have an influence eventually on Germany's support of Ukraine? As I mentioned before, we are not only talking about the the radical right AfD. We are talking about the left radical, the Wagenknecht Party as well. I mean, they got from nowhere to sixteen percent uh, in both states in, uh, in Thuringia and Saxony, and I'm sure it will be the same level in in Brandenburg, you know, next Sunday. So what you have here are, uh, is a radical left and a radical right. Uh, that are both Putin friendly. Some people say they are financed by Putin, uh, and but they they uh, somehow uh, use the historical fear of Russia. You know uh, the terror that Russian troops have uh, perpetrated on Ukraine. Is quite extraordinary and it reminds people in the East, maybe more so than in the West, of World War II. I mean, where 200,000 German women were raped. Uh, <clears throat> now, you have, I don't know why this suddenly vanished. I'm sorry. We, we, can, we can see you, Manfred. We can see you. I, can, we can I cannot you. see you. 
Well, well just just keep going. Okay. So uh, what you are confronted with, you know, is a radicalization on the left and the right, and somehow incompetence at the center, represented by Schultz. And the, the Greens, you know, who were at 20% uh, in the last election, where <clears throat> Habeck made uh, a lot of mistakes uh, and uh, as finance, as uh, Minister of Economy and Vice Chancellor, uh, that has led to a decline of the attractiveness, the attraction of the Greens not only in the East, but also in the West. So I don't know uh, what happens. To, I mean, Sunday is very important to see what happens in that election in the East, uh, whether the Social Democrats will be able of um, retaining power. Hmm. You know, Manfred, um, you describe sea changes, and sea changes by definition always have the implication of changing other things. That's why they call them sea changes. It happens under the hood, and you don't realize exactly how things are changing and how they're uh, affecting other aspects of that community. Um, and I would like to know whether you were looking at, whether you saw any indication of the effect of the sea change that we have been talking about with the German economy. Well, look, the German economy was in the doldrums in the early 2000s as well, when the Social Democrats came to power and Schroeder then made some radical changes. And within a few years, Germany was performing according to the old standards. I mean, you can say the same thing about uh, Japan today, about uh, China, to some extent, uh, the US. So I do not, I mean, people expect that the the loan, the um, salary raises that German labor unions have negotiated will uh, help to restart the market, uh, the economy uh, in Germany itself. Now, Angela Merkel, you know, you could say has been not very good in, despite her PhD in physics, in supporting um, the digitalization of the economy and doing enough, you know, to uh, help to modernize the German economy. Uh, now, that has become quite uh, obvious. Whether the Christian Democrats, when they come to power, as some feel next uh, next year, if the Social Democrats and the Greens don't get their act together, I think the 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 the, the, the neoliberals will be out of the parliament. You know, they didn't make it in the two state elections in Thuringia and Saxony uh, two weeks ago, and so we will see about that. So I'm not I'm not. Um, pessimistic about the recovery because you have to understand the German economy was a world champion in exports. And the two places that were getting German products, uh, China and the US, uh, have not been very receptive of uh, German products uh, over the last two years. So the German economy, you know, is in that sense uh, in <laughs> the process of coming to terms with the fact that they are not, they cannot any longer rely on export markets in order to be successful. Okay, uh, Tim, you have more on this. Uh, Manford, you know, I think a big part of the Brexit movement in England was that uh, England didn't want to necessarily accept the quotas of immigration set forth by the EU. And those quotas, you know, in their minds was excessive. And that was a catalyst for, for Brexit. And I'm just curious to what degree um, those EU quotas of immigration 
um, set off a resentment of immigration from, from people, that they were taking the, the, a lion's share of the immigration population, certainly much more than, than other nations in the EU, and whether people felt that was um, rather intrusive to their cultural identity or, or economic um, prosperity. First, Brexit, you have to remember um, the majority of foreign workers that worked in Britain before Brexit were from the European Union, from Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, wherever. Uh, so you had millions of EU workers working in Great Britain. It was not so much the migrants that uh, caused this kind of rebellion that became manifest in the in the uh, Brexit. And as you know, uh, there are a lot of people in Great Britain today who regret, you know, Brexit. There's a majority <laughs> of, an, and there's an anti-Brexit majority now in Great Britain. But I do not think, you know, that the quota issue really plays a role in Germany because Germany has been overwhelmed not only by the one million Syrians and Afghanis that came in 19, in 2015 when Angela Merkel asked that German borders do not become um, closed, but you have uh, asylum seekers that uh, are coming because of the German constitution, you know, a clause in the German constitution. Uh, it, so both these numbers are not affected by the quota system of the EU. But I mean, when you are looking at, when you're going to restaurants, when you're going to stores in Germany, um, you know, you, um, meet, you encounter a lot of foreigners. Uh, the German social and economic infrastructure uh, has become, you could say, taken over by a foreign workforce. And without that workforce, you know, if, if Germany would follow the Trumpian uh, solution, the German economy would collapse. Uh, I mean, the American collapse uh, economy would not uh, really uh, become, would not brilliantly perform without all of these legal and illegal migrants either. So in that sense, you have this uh, hypocrisy, you could say, the hypocrisy that you have in the US, as well as in Germany, when it comes to the presence of migrants. Both societies need them. Um, desperately in order to um, replenish the declining um, population basis. I mean, look, when you're thinking of, of the West German states, uh, the population in West Germany has grown by close to 70% since World War II, whereas the East German population has declined radically before unification and after unification. Mm -hmm. It's in a way you could say, say it's a depopulated uh, part of, not completely, but I mean, when people say, you know, these 12 or 15 million represent the population level of 1905, uh, I mean, it's quite amazing. Hold on for a second, Manfred. I, okay. I want to give uh, Gina, uh, it's an opportunity to uh, weigh in and ask another question. Yes, um, I, I'd like to comment on your last response to my question about the AFD meeting with Schultz, Hecke and Schultz. Schultz did not ask to meet with the Greens or the people on the left. So I'm drilling down on the AFD because um, granted that the left has also risen uh, quite spectacularly in the East, uh, it's the right that um, seems to be reaching out to other right-wing parties in Europe through an umbrella group that they have together. They've met with one another. They presumably exchange ideas and they share uh, policy attitudes, including uh, the immigration 
wanting to, to curb immigration and also wanting to curb support of Ukraine. Uh, and also, I would like to know, because in the United States, there has been connections between uh, right-wing people. In fact, our Justice Samuel Alito just met with a baroness in Germany who's affiliated with the AFD. So we know that this exchange of ideas is going on. And my question to you is, does the AFD manifest any sense of demographic concern about its racial and ethnic identity in the face of these new immigrants coming in? And to what degree does this sense of um, ethnic German identity um, sort of jumpstart interest on the part of some of these unaffiliated young men who are resentful? The uh, young men that you can see in demonstrations in Leipzig or Dresden and other uh, East German cities, uh, they look like white uh, American men of the same age group. Uh, so what you have there, you know, is uh, white racism uh, that you have in Hungary, that you have in, in other places as well. But so far, it is, I would say, talking to people in, I, I mean, I was in Munich and Berlin, especially, Talking to them, it is still an Eastern, primarily an Eastern problem. And the AFD will have problems, you know, becoming, growing in the West because you have still these regular demonstrations uh, against them as neo fascists, as in, and you have to remember you have all of these West German cities being um, the places where these 17% of Germans with immigration background are living. So for that reason, you know, I'm not, I think there are limits to it. And then you have now this radical left party, Wagenknecht. I remember Wagenknecht, you know, is married to a former charismatic chairman of the German Social Democratic Party. Um, Oscar Lafontaine, he is in his 80s now, but he was a guy who was against unification. I mean, he could have uh, beaten Helmut Kohl after unification in national elections, but he was, unlike Helmut Kohl, uh, against the uh, reunification. Uh, so you have I sometimes say, you know, two, two, a couple now that consist of two stupid, politically stupid people, Lafontaine and Wagenknecht. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Lafontaine is the whisperer in Wagenknecht's ear. But apart from that, no, I do not, I do not think that you will have, you know, what you see now in Sweden and what you see in Norway and in Denmark. Uh, this radical attempt, you know, to get rid of um, get rid of migrants. I think Germans have, as as at least as I see it, they have accepted uh, the fact that Germany, as an economic powerhouse, will not survive if they get rid of all of the people with Mike and background. Let me go to a question I have for you, Manfred. And that is, uh, you know, US, the US culture seems to me over the, over the years has gotten closer and closer to Germany. We are very shoulder to shoulder with Germany in so many ways. And Germany follows us and we follow Germany. We admire Germany and I know Germany admires us. Uh, and you can speak to that. But the question is, we have a problem in this election. Um, we have uh, threats and divisiveness. We have questions raised 
uh, not only about immigrants, but about abortion. Uh, we have questions raised as to the, the rule of law, the continuation of our admirable democracy and our constitution. And I know that the German people are following that. So when you were there, you probably had multiple discussions with them about their views over America. What are their views? How are the two connected? And how will this election affect Germany? You may be surprised when I say that it would be maybe good for Europe if Trump wins the election, because it will bring, it will bring the EU, the 27 EU countries closer together. They will have to become more united than they have ever been. And Trump will be, uh, in a way, the uh, the power, the negative power to bring that about. I mean, remember the American ambassador in Berlin, Grinnell, who is uh, now uh, touted as uh, a cabinet minister in uh, Trump's uh, uh, imagined second term, he went from one radical right-wing party from the AFD to all of the others and uh, supported them. Now, he is the official ambassador of the United States and Germany, who, who during uh, Angela Merkel's term, you know, went and uh, courted the AFD and uh, the radical parties in Poland, right-wing parties in Poland, in Hungary, in Holland. It was absolutely sickening to see that. So you have a lot of also that negative connection, uh, the solid pro-American West German politics certainly is still there, but you have also an amazing amount of anti-Americanism in East Germany, especially in in the in the AfD and in the and the radical left party. Um, they, in a way, uh, make this argument that uh, that Trump makes uh, that uh, Putin was provoked uh, to invite invade the Ukraine because America pushed the boundaries of NATO closer and closer to uh, to Russia. Now, all of that is absurd, but nevertheless, ideological arguments, as absurd as they may sound, have some have some power. Mm. But you see, one of the one of the major things that I find uh, disturbing, and I saw that on this trip, and I follow that in German newspapers as well, was the the unwillingness of the political and intellectual class connected with the former GDR uh, to enter into a processing of their past. I mean, West Germany went into this processing of the Nazi past in the seventh front the 70s uh, until uh, today. But uh, in the East, you could say there are two unprocessed pasts waiting for processing, the Nazi past and the communist past. And they don't want to talk about it, want, don't want to deal with it. They consider that, you know, uh, charges that uh, the West German colonizers uh, are imposing on them. Uh, I've, uh, I'm always, I mean, look, when you are, I, I just read an article in a Berlin newspaper, the Tagesspiegel by Kastorf, you know, a very famous uh, theater director who talks about the grandiose days that he had when he was, uh, you know, an East German theater director. And these statements, you remind me of statements by, famous West German intellectuals in the early, in the late 40s and 50s, 
um, including Richard Strauss, you know, Richard Strauss, the great composer, he went, he emigrated after the collapse of Nazi Germany. He emigrated uh, to Switzerland uh, in 45. I mean, uh, if there is an absurd political movement, you could say it is, uh, it was that. Uh, but you have other famous intellectuals, you know, um, compo uh, directors, Furtwängler, Karajan, um, especially Emil Nolde, the great painter. You know, he were, they were all collaborators and they refused to uh, talk about it, make it mm. part of uh, the transfer. I mean, they did not publicly enter into um, a reconsideration of their past. And the same thing, I think, has happened with East German intellectuals. Okay. Uh, we're almost out of time, and I want to offer you guys the opportunity to try to uh, integrate all of these thoughts and possibilities. Um, let's see. Jean, why don't you go first? Manfred has uh, given us a good overview of uh, contemporary Germany after its more recent elections and especially focusing on the split. Uh, I don't know how you would characterize this. It, to some extent, is political. To some extent, is demographic, economic, between East and West Germany. Uh, East Germany, of course, having been occupied by the Soviet Union until the fall of the Berlin Wall. And <clears throat> this has had a profound impact on one or two generations, and we see how fast change can happen, political and social change can happen. Um, I will be going to Germany uh, and Poland and Lithuania next month. And my son, who lives in East Germany near Chemnitz in a town called Mitweida, that has a technical university, is living in a house with uh, Germans younger than himself. Uh, he's been keeping a blog for like four years or more. Uh, he hasn't had a whisper about politics or uh, the rise of uh, the right wing or uh, the incel movement or anything like that. But we, I will see for myself, we will be traveling together and he speaks fluent German. However, I do have a concern that this split between East and West Germany, it's not exactly the same as the split after the Civil War between the North and the South in America. But the consequences of that split could be profound. And as we know, Viktor Orban has become a poster child, a strongman poster child, for democracies uh, who have pluralities of populations that are resentful toward those who don't share their background and that they don't feel identified with and they feel are taking their place, um, especially numerically. And um, Hungary, of course, is closer to East Germany than West Germany. So I remain concerned not about the German federal government in any sense. I think it will maintain itself probably much more with greater stability than Italy and France, certainly, and perhaps the Netherlands, which has a right-wing government. And Britain has been through its stresses and strains with that too. Germany is a solid economy. It's the healthy man of Europe. And uh, people seem to be satisfied um, the question is, will this nascent elite party of right-wing intellectuals uh, that have some uh, influence on the United States as well, uh, will it grow to the point where uh, it will threaten Germany's support of NATO, Germany's support of Ukraine, Germany's support of the EU and the lower tier of countries 
that are not as economically healthy as Germany over time? That's my question. And, and that's what it leaves me. It leaves me with these questions, a sense of, okay, everything's fine, but we really need to keep our eye on the ball here. Well, Manfred, uh, do you want to make a short answer? Because we're really out of time. I do not think this is the future Germany is heading toward. Uh, I, I think the solid democratization, you know, in the West is an insurance against a development like, like that. Um, and Jean mentioned the American Civil War. You know, you, you have to remember you have, there were three parties after the Civil War. You have the triumphant North, you have uh, the defeated South, who however never believed in the South, and then you had Black America as the third America, and it had to wait until the 1960s, you know, for the civil rights legislation to to make the amendments that were passed after the Civil War to become reality. And you could say, you know, this tripartition, this division of America in the three parts, the Northern, the Southern, and the Black, uh, lingered on for, well, still lingers on to some extent, uh, even if it's uh, more ideologically and emotionally than uh, if for the two white parts, uh, political, but for the black part, it certainly still is. So in that sense, you know, I sometimes look at the post-Civil War the United States as an illustration of what happens to divided uh, countries that are unwilling to undergo um, processing their pasts. Um, and I think what characterizes Germany today is you have had this processing of the past, the Nazi past in the West, and to some extent, well, very limited communist-oriented uh, processing of the Nazi past in the East, uh, but not of the communist past that they have, I mean, 35 years after unification or whatever the time frame since 1989 is, or 1990, they have not done that. And that, I think, is lingering on in the East for, uh, I don't know, how long would that will last? We'll have to leave it there, Manfred. Um, Tim, what do we learn here today? What we learned is that it's a multi-hydra-headed uh, complexity. And it's just not immigration. It's just not um, conservative versus liberal, that there are many things that go into the mix of this discussion. So uh, I know we're running out of time. So I'll leave it to you, Jay, to, to end things up. But I'd like to thank Manfred and, and Gene for their, their great comments and their perspectives. Yeah, Manfred, thanks. We're glad, glad you got back OK. I'm glad you came on the show. We want to have more of this. And Gene, we wish you well on your trip. We hope you get back okay. And, and when you get back, we want to debrief you about everything you learned. And Manfred, I only want to say one thing. If you think that Trump is going to help Europe, even by a reverse backlash, we should have a beer together. <laughs> <laughs> Manfred Henningsen, Gene okay. Rosenfeld. Tim Apicella, thank you very much. Aloha.